today's presentation, we have um, Mike Stagg, the infamous Mike Stagg, will be presenting today on preparing for emergencies. This is a this is such an important subject any time of year, but particularly as we go into the change of seasons. You want to take the ball there, Mike? And, um, this is a this is a pretty uh, challenging time because seasons are changing and uh, weather's changing. And boy, you look out the window today. And uh, it looks a little sketchy out there. And apparently over the next couple of days, we're going to have some serious wind and weather. So Mike, talk to us yeah. about emergencies. Yeah, thanks, Jason. Um, so this, I mean, this topic here is hopefully going to be a great, a great review for many of us. Um, and just some, some things to, to think about as we look to prepare for any kind of emergencies that could, could come across our way. So just some, a few of our goals today, we want to help increase some preparedness at, at work, right? Uh, of course, uh, also at home. Hopefully some of the things we take here can, can be applied to your home life um, when you're out on the road or if you're actually the responder in case of an emergency. So let's take a look at the, the first thing is steps, right? Steps to preparing for an emergency. Number one is just admitting it can happen, right? Emergencies can happen at any time. Fires, yeah, they can happen. We know that. What about the lesser known things or the lesser common things? Earthquakes, floods, um, tornadoes, east winds, <laughs> you know, those kind of things. Admit that those kind of things can also happen. And secondly, evaluate your exposures, right? So maybe a fire is number one on our exposure list because it could happen at any time. Whereas a tornado, it should be up there, but is it necessarily happening or has a chance to happen very regularly? I don't know. So we have to evaluate uh, the exposure that we have and then create a plan, have an emergency action plan for each different scenario, whether that's a fire, whether that's an active shooter, whether that's a cyber breach, um, all these things should have some kind of emergency action plan built around them and build those preparations now. So start now and build those preparations and be ready to act. What that means being ready to act is you have to test it. You've got a plan and you've got to test your emergency action plan, right? So we can admit that these exposures can happen and then identify them, create plans around them. But if we don't actually put them into action and test them, I mean, they're only as good as what we do. So we have to make sure that we're testing our emergency action plans and practicing those things regularly. We'll talk about that here in a minute. But really, first, I wanted to start out with a poll. Um, and I wanted you to just open up your chat box, go ahead and type it in here, and think about what right now is the emergency that frightens you the most? Like, what is the scariest thing that you could think about as far as an emergency goes? Um, for me, I think it's it could be the the unexplained or the one that you don't have control over, right? Those ones are are absolutely so scary because it's somebody else or something else is acting on you or your property or your friends or your family. And you're thinking, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? Because I don't have control of the situation anymore. So do we have any, it looks like we have some in the, in the chat there. Jason. We, what do we, what do we got? We do, Mike. And, and we have, let's see, at least four or five say earthquake. Earthquakes. Um, so earthquakes, early fire, terrorist attack, active shooter yeah so uh, you can see those things that we don't have control over right it seems to be a common theme um and that's why we want to prepare right because if we prepare it doesn't matter what the emergency may be but if we're prepared and we planned these things ahead then we can we know how to act in case of an emergency like for me for example an earthquake that doesn't frighten me too much because I, I I lived a portion of my life in Taiwan where there's a lot of earthquakes. And so you kind of used to it. But like somebody mentioned active shooter, like that freaks me out just because we see so much of that going on. And that is completely out of our control. Um, Mike, we had a, had another, another response that said extreme windstorm, which oh, yeah. we yeah. might experience you, today. You live in Centerville, my friend, because that's what's going on at my house right now. <laughs> you know, and you know, Mike, just to, just to throw one for myself, lightning 
I've been yeah. I've been caught in some lightning storms out in the mountains, uh, you know, in a in a very exposed situation. And boy, oh, that's that's terrifying. That is terrifying. I can see it. Like, yeah, especially up in the mountains and no, nowhere to seek shelter. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but now take a take a look at um, what is your most likely emergency? So now think about that. You know, is the earthquake? Is that really likely? Is the active shooter? Is that really likely? Is a fire, is that likely? So now as you look at it, take a reality check and look at your actual exposure, right? Those things that you're most scared about and that, that keeps you up at night, how likely is it that that emergency is actually going to happen and actually occur? Might be a finger cut is, is the most likely emergency. That's right. <laughs> That's right. You know, finger cut, paper cut, uh, an accident, a, a car accident, a backing accident, something like that. That is one of our most likely emergencies, perhaps. Well, the, the biggest thing is just admitting that these accidents can happen, right? There's about 3 million workplace accidents every year with about 5,000 workplace fatalities. I mean, just staggering numbers. 11 million auto accidents every year with one auto accident about every 10 years of driving is what you can expect. Um, and about 1.4 million fires every, every year that produce 17, about 17,500 injuries and about 3,000 deaths. So when you think about that, I mean, the statistics are there that say accidents happen, emergencies happen, right? What we can do is be prepared for those emergencies. Right. But as we look at our different exposures, right, just like Jason said, maybe the thing that's going to be the most common thing that might happen might be just a cut or a bruise or a burn. Right. Those things that happen just because of the work that we do. Um, auto accidents. Auto accidents are a huge exposure for you. Right. And you think about it. We we drive a lot. We go a lot of places. Um, and when we realize that. We are so exposed in auto accidents uh, to, to different factors, you know, things that are out of our control. We should take measures to plan so that we can eliminate some of our exposures in those areas. Things like backing safely, things like choosing a correct parking spot, you know, those kind of things that we can prepare for. Severe weather, fire, earthquakes, you know, we have exposures to these things. These things could happen to us. So what we need to do is we need to evaluate our different exposures to our different um, scenarios of emergencies. So what dangers are you exposed to? You know, write them down. Get those on a list and write them down and then rank them. Rank them according to what you think you're going to be exposed to today or what you might be exposed to tomorrow or next week or next month or next year or this current year, right? Think about those things. Am I going to be exposed to a potential fire hazard tomorrow? Maybe. So do we have a plan around that? Are we going to be exposed to maybe a tornado today? I don't know. We might be with all the high winds and the, the, the crazy atmospheric conditions that are going on. We, I mean, it very well could happen. Do we have a plan around that? Right? So take your dangers that you be, believe you could be exposed to, write them down, and rank them accordingly. And how your plan has now um, started to take shape on your different types of emergencies that you have. First thing you wanna do is identify your property risks, right? Identify those risks and know what you own. Know what sidewalks you're, you're responsible for. Know what playgrounds and parks you're responsible for. Know what buildings you're responsible for and what parts of those buildings. Make sure you inspect those things. Inspecting your property helps to identify the risks associated around that property. Helps you to cover your tail in case something happens. And that's, this is something that Jason and I are more than happy to help with, is helping you identify your property risk, helping you come up with your, your start implementing an inspection program around your parks, your, your sidewalks, your buildings, your, your property, everything that's going, that you have control over and um, control over and um, stewardship over, there we go, and stewardship over, you should know what you own and make sure you inspect it. So get in touch with Jason or myself. We're more than happy to, to help, uh, help you with setting up this inspection program because this is going to help you identify those risks and evaluate your different exposures behind what you own. So really, 
right, first thing, I wanted to do a, a preparedness reality check with everybody. What this is, just a little game. Just want to play a little game this morning. What I want you to do is close your eyes. Okay, everyone close your eyes. Don't fall asleep. And point to the answer when I say this question. Okay? Go ahead and close your eyes and point to your nearest exit. Where is your nearest exit? From, your, from the place where you are right now, point. Okay, now open your eyes. Take a look. Are you pointing where you thought the exit was? If you're in a room with a lot of people, is everyone pointing to the same exit? Um, okay, close your eyes. Next one. Where is your nearest fire extinguisher? Point to that. Where is that at? Okay, open your eyes. Take a look. Did you identify it? Did you find it? If you had no idea where it was, be pointed at yourself saying, I'm the fire extinguisher with my bottle of water. Might want to look at that and see where that fire extinguisher is. Okay, next one. First aid kit. Close your eyes. Where's your nearest first aid kit? Let's add on to that. Where is your nearest AED? Do you know where those are at? Okay, everyone open your eyes. Everyone point in the same area. Okay, last one. Close your eyes. And where is your emergency? Where do you evacuate to? If you had to evacuate your building, where would you meet? Where do where is your um where is your muster area? Where does everyone go? Okay, go ahead and open your eyes. Everyone know where you're supposed to go? If you're in a large room, is everyone pointing to the same place? <laughs> okay. Thank you. So what we have to do, we've got to create a plan so that we all are on the same page, right? Create your emergency action plans based on your different exposures. Each of your different exposures, fire, earthquake, flood, um, active shooter, em medical emergency, each of those things should have some kind of emergency action plan, okay? Each of these plans should be realistic and it should be super simple, right? So everybody from the, the boss, the big boss man or woman, all the way down to the person with boots on the ground and everywhere in between, you should be able to follow that plan and be able to know what each and every person is responsible for. for. Um, it should have what you should do and what you, what you do and what you should do in case of that emergency. Biggest thing is, that when you're creating your emergency action plans, they need to be specific based on those specific scenarios and then very, very simple, right? So anyone could follow it. Anyone could pick up that plan on their very first day of work and look at it and say, okay, I know exactly what I'm supposed to do in case of an emergency. Emergency planning is a legal requirement. So according to OSHA, everyone has to have an emergency action plan and, they and a fire prevention plan. These, both these plans, they are, you are required by OSHA to train on them. Number one, when an employee is hired. So when, when you are hired, you're supposed to be trained on that emergency action plan on your very first day. And number two, if there's a job change. So if you move from one area to another, or you have an employee who transfers job positions or, or um, locations or something like that, they have to be trained on the new emergency action plan of the place where they're going to be working or the job that they're going to be performing. Also, the other requirement from OSHA is that this plan is trained on regularly. What does that mean in OSHA speak regularly, right? OSHA speak uh, regularly in OSHA speak just means you should train annually on that. So when's the last time you trained on your emergency action plan? When's the last time you got it, got it out and looked at it and got, you, got everyone together and said, let's practice. We're gonna practice our emergency action plan. Has it been in the last annually, last 12 months? Um, here at the trust, I mean, we would, we would, we would absolutely encourage you to practice this more often than annually, right? Just so it's fresh in your mind. If you haven't practiced your emergency action plan in nine months, how are you going to remember? How are you going to remember everything that you're supposed to do or, or who is responsible for what portion of, of this emergency action plan? Heck, I can't even remember what happened nine days ago, let alone nine months ago when I read through this plan. So let's make sure that we make this a goal, that we go through our emergency action plans and we have it reviewed and we practice it, not just review it, but practice it annually, right? Do a fire drill, do an earthquake drill. What would we do if an active shooter came in, okay? How have we practiced our EAPs, emergency action plan, in our, in our organizations? Because it is required. So we, 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 should, we should really do that. Um, so our, our requirements of an emergency action plan, the things that you have to have in there, right? You have to have a means of reporting emergencies. So you have to have a 
um, like a call sign or a signal or something like a fire alarm, right? That's a great, uh, that's a great means of reporting an emergency. Um, this should include your evacuation procedures and routes. Where do we go? Where do we muster? What happens? Um, where, where's the routes that we take? It should have there the emergency responder roles in the plan. So who takes on what role in case of, of an emergency? These, um, these plans should specifically spell out what each person does in case this specific emergency happens. Not by name, right? You don't want Mike in your plan. You don't want Jason in your plan because Mike and Jason may not be there, but you should have it by job title or location or, or you know, employee A, employee B, whatever it is. And you should know if you're in whatever position that you might be in, what your role is in case of, of an emergency. This is why practicing your EAPs is so important, right? Because we may not be doing the same thing every time an emergency comes. And we need to know what our role is in case that emergency happens, okay? Um, it should have your rescue and medical roles and duties. Who takes on the roles of rescuing? Or who takes on the medical role? Who takes on the role of grabbing the AED or grabbing the first aid kit or grabbing the go bag so you can get out of the building? Where is that written down? And have you practiced on that? That is a huge part of our emergency action plans. So the very first thing is emergency alerts, right? How do you know if an emergency has happened? What's your system? Do you have a fire alarm? Do you use bullhorns? Do you have sirens? Do you have an intercom system? And all your systems that you have, does it cover everyone and everywhere? So you may have that like in, in your main office building, but think about that in your, in your shop where the lawnmowers are repaired. Do you have an emergency alert system there? Do you, what, what is that? Is it a, is it a bullhorn? Is it a, is it a, um, an air horn that you, that you blow? Is it an intercom system? Is it a whistle? You know, what is it? Think about that. And if it covers everything and everybody and everywhere, anything could, anything could happen. Have you monitored and tested it? Have you tested your, first, your, your fire alarms? When's the last time you did a fire alarm drill? When's the last time you tested the intercom system to make sure it works okay? Um, what about social media? Right, social media is a great tool to use, right? To alert your community, also to alert yourself and your staff members if things are going on, if things are happening. I would absolutely encourage you to be connected to, to the social media around your area, especially those in police districts, fire districts, EMS, emergency medical services. Make sure, be connected to those things because they could help save lives. They really could. I'll tell you a story real quick. It was 8, 8 o'clock in the morning, 8.20. Um, I'm getting my kids ready to go to school. Um, and they, they walk down the hill every day to go to school. It's about, you know, it's not, it's not too far. Um, getting my kids ready. There had been a high speed chase earlier in the day. I'm not watching the news. I don't know what's going on. And there was a high speed chase. Guy crashes on the freeway, runs across the freeway, up into the neighborhoods, up into the foothills where I'm at, barricades himself inside a house and takes a family hostage, right? They're trying to reverse 911 call the, the neighborhood. I don't have a landline, right? I just have cell phones. And I'm getting ready to send my kids to school. All of a sudden, I get an alert on my phone because I'm subscribed to the, the city's um, Twitter page, the, the city's police department Twitter page. Get an alert on my phone that says active shooter in the area, shelter in place. I was five minutes away from sending my kids down the road to walk to school. And they were going to pass within a couple of blocks of this house. Now, had I not been subscribed to that, I would never have seen that message and I could have potentially sent my kids in, a, in an area that wouldn't have been safe for them. So these social media alerts, they help a lot. So I would encourage you to look up and get connected with those things. So if something happens or is happening in your area, that you can then try and put your emergency action plan into place to, to protect your property, to protect the lives of the people who, who you have um, stewardship over. Okay. Evacuation procedures and routes. These are super important to have inside of your emergency action plans, okay? These should be posted and you should have clear routes. So inside of your plan, you should know where you go in case of an emergency. According to OSHA and according to state code, if, you're, um, if you've identified a, a route inside of your plan as an evacuation route, it has to be posted as such. 
So you have to post that as an emergency exit with at least four inch tall letters. So that could be a sticker, it could be vital lettering, it could be a sign, it could be a lit sign. Um, but you have to identify that very clearly that it is an emergency exit. Um, and so if it's identified in your plan as an emergency exit, make sure that you mark it and post it as such around your facility as well. Make sure it addresses everybody, it addresses ADA, it addresses um, folks who aren't able to get around as easily. You avoid certain structures and areas that may be problematic in case of like an earthquake, for example. Um, and think about secondary places of refuge. What if your, your first place that, you're, that you want to evacuate to, what if it's torn up or blown away or not there anymore or, or, or on fire <laughs> and you're evacuating? Have a secondary place that you might evacuate to in case your initial, initial area is compromised and you can't go there anymore. Everyone inside of your emergency action plan should have a role and responsibility. So that means everyone who's working, everyone on staff, right, who's working that day should have some kind of role to play in, in the emergency. And that helps protect you. It helps protect your property, helps protect any visitors or public you may have inside of your facilities. So it should say who does what? Who does what role? Who meets the fire truck? Who calls 911? Who grabs the, the go bag? Who does all of these specific things? It should also have contact information. Contact information for 911, right? It should have the number 911 inside of your emergency action plan. This person calls 911, should be in there. And I'm here to tell you that you're thinking, man, that's crazy. Like 911, everyone knows the number 911. No one's gonna forget that. It happens, right? Emergency happens, brain turns off. I, I had this happen personally to me. It was, it was, um, I was a recreation director. There was an emergency out in our pool area, in our swimming pool area. And one of the lifeguards run in, runs into the office and says, Mike, we have an emergency. I need you to come and help us on the pool deck. Um, so I run out there and I, I turned to the girl who was a lifeguard, who had been a lifeguard for a number of years. And we practice emergency action plans inside of a swimming pool environment constantly because it's so important. Um, so we're constantly practicing our, our emergency action plans. And I asked her, I said, okay, I need you to go call 911. And she says, okay. She runs into the lifeguard office, grabs her cell phone, runs out to me and says, what's the number? And I'm thinking, it's 911. How do you not know? It's because emergency happens, brain turns off, right? So make sure you have the number 911 inside of your emergency action plan. Um, and think about what type of response you're going to have in case of, a, of this emergency, right? Are you going to have fire extinguishers in each firefight? Are you getting medical responders? If you have fire extinguishers and firefighting, have you trained? Have you trained the employees on the use of the fire extinguisher? Also, another requirement that OSHA says is that if you have a fire, if you have a um, emergency action plan and you're requiring them to use a fire extinguisher, that they have to be trained on that. They have to be trained every year. Okay. Rescue medical roles. Who will provide first aid and CPR? What kind of equipment will you use? Have you been trained on how to use that? Do you know where the first aid kit is? Do you know where the AED is? Is your AED been inspected? Is the batteries and pads good? Are they not expired? So making sure that these things are known and where these the, the location of these, these devices are at inside of your emergency action plan is very, very important. It's also important that we train our employees, that you're trained. Right? When you get trained, designate and train people to, to, um, to put forth these plans. What is their roles and responsibilities? Make sure they're reviewed by employees regularly. Your emergency action plan should be available for any employee to grab and pick up and read or peruse or review whenever they want to. So make sure it's available for them. Um, your, you should have all of your critical information, like your emergency action plans, your facility maps, your utility plan, your contact list, should be available somewhere outside of the building as well. Jason, Jason at one time worked for an organization and they had a their, their place where they stored all their critical information was in a locked, um, a locked mailbox outside of the building. It had everything in there. So if the building's on fire and you have to evacuate, you have all of your information that you need right there for you. Because you don't want to be having to run back inside the building to grab your evacuation plan, right? Evacuation plans should have all these emergency contacts on it. 911, your internal contact numbers, the police, the fire. They should have all of those things on there. The first thing 
inside of your emergency action plan, you should have some kind of preparedness go bag. A go bag helps you be prepared for whatever comes your way or no matter what your job title is. You should know what the go bag is and should know what's in that. So what goes in, the, in a go bag? A checklist in this kind of situation is a very, very great tool for you to use. It helps you identify strengths and weaknesses of your go bag, right? Do I have everything that I need inside that go bag? So a go bag is just a portable supply of tools that you would grab in case of an emergency. Things like a 72 hour kit or a road emergency kit, maybe a zombie apocalypse kit, you know, those things that you need in order to survive. You might need several, you might need different ones for different kinds of emergencies, okay? Different types and kits. You can get a five gallon bucket. I talked about the, the, the metal mailbox that we had. Maybe it's a duffel bag, maybe it's a big backpack. Many different types of kits and containers can be used for your go bag. So go bag supplies, just some, some general um, things, retroreflective vests, safety glasses, N95 respirators. Those things should definitely make their way inside your go bag. Also make sure you have a clipboard with paper. And I would, and if you have pens in there, have backups like pencils that are sharpened or mechanical pencils because pens tend to go out, right? So make sure you have something that you can write with and write on that's going to be reliable. Make sure you have a flashlight with batteries and extra batteries. Make sure you have your, your cell phone and it's charged and you have a, a portable charging block that's charged so that you can charge your cell phone if you need to. Um, make sure you have your incident report forms, your accident report forms, and um, any kind of caution tape or masking tape you might need to, to block off areas. Also in your go bag, you want supplies to fix and isolate things. Things like duct tape or lockout tagout kit. Duct tape is not just good for fixing things. It's also good for keeping people out of places you don't want them to go, okay? So make sure you have a, a kit and ways to fix and isolate different things inside of your go bag. Also want some references and documents inside that go bag. Things like your emergency action plan and employee roster. So you make sure that everybody gets out of the building that needs to. Diagram of your facilities. Your SDS forms of your most common chemicals. and where those chemical inventories and lo locations are. So the emergency medical services can come and say, do you have any hazardous chemicals? Yes, we do. Here's where they're at. Make sure that's in those documentation is inside of your go bag. Other things you might want in there, things for an extended event, things like food and water, right? MREs, um, things that are high energy that store for a long time so that if you need to, you know, your bug out kit, whatever you want to call it. Um, so that if you have to kind of live off this for a little bit, you're able to do so. Devices and communication, make sure you, like I said, have your cell phone. Um, make sure that it's charged. If it's not charged, have a secondary device there that you can use to charge it, like a, like a, like a battery backup or a, um, like one of those pockets battery chargers. Those things work great. A bullhorn, you know, make sure you have a way to communicate to many people over a large area. Um, and your social media, great way, great thing to do. But what happens if the power is out and you can't charge things? Okay, make sure that's why you want to have spare batteries. You can maybe invest in something that's solar, a, a solar a solar array to charge a cell phone or to charge uh, a radio or to charge a flashlight. Okay, because if your building's gone and it's on fire, you don't want to be running back in there to grab the batteries or the battery charger or your cell phone. Um, also take a look at your cyber risk and your cyber, and your, um, cyber plan. Is your cyber security um, emergency action plan as robust or more robust than your fire plan if in case there's a fire in your building or there's an active shooter? If it's not, take a look at that and it, because it should be because you have so many critical documents, right? What are those critical documents? Do you have hard and soft copies of them? Do you have ways to back them up? Do you have a thumb drive? How do you access this kind of these documentation in case your systems are compromised, right? We're, you want to make sure that you have these redundancies in place. So if there's an emergency that hacks your servers and now you've got to put this emergency action plan into place, how do you back it up? Where is your backups and how do you access your critical data? So take a look at that because that's something that is, you know, we may do a good job with our fire prevention and our and our earthquake evacuation plans. But what about our cyber plan? Let's let's take a look at that and make sure that we have a good plan there. So just in summary, just accept that you know things can happen. 
right? Train, 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 train. Because your plan is only as good as the amount of time you put in training on it. Because you never know when something's going to happen. And you don't want to have a plan that you haven't trained on in the last two years have to be put into place when you haven't trained on it. And when, you, when you're not aware of what could be happening or going on. Um, okay. So that's that's really all that that's all I have for you today. Um, our, it's just super important with these EAPs. Folks, if you got any questions or comments, please type those into the chat box. We did have one have one question in there. Uh, we had a request uh, if anybody has a template or good emergency action plan, if 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 they wouldn't mind sharing that, we would be happy to facilitate. Uh, if you want oh, yeah. to send those plans, you can send those to Mike or myself, just Mike or Jason or not. It's <laughs> Jason. <laughs> at utahtrust.gov or mike at utahtrust.gov and we'll send that out to the entire group that signed up for this we also have a boilerplate that we'll send out uh, when the video of this is up on youtube we'll send out a, a reminder of that so um so we'd be happy to happy to do that and if you have something that you that's really great and you'd like to share it we'd love to see it and share it with the group um not seeing any questions or comments there I did, I, I did make an observation that spam is one of the most important emergency uh, preparedness tools, though. <laughs> spam. It All holds right. forever, and it, and it tastes the same. It doesn't matter. Right. <laughs> Very good. Uh, let's see. Great reminders and training. Thanks for putting this together. Trust does, uh, does an amazing job helping us uh, in these areas. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate it. Appreciate that. Uh, kudo. Um, and we appreciate all of you out there. Mike, final uh, final uh, thoughts? No, just go out and make sure you have a safe day and practice those plans. I mean, if you don't know where your emergency action plan is or you don't have a plan in case for a specific kind of emergency, build that and get with Jason and myself and we're, we're, we're happy to help however we can. Okay, awesome. Thanks, Mike. Just a reminder that we'll be doing our, our fraud prevention webinar here in about 25 minutes. So if you haven't signed up for that, go to our website, utahtrust.gov and click on training and events and you can sign up there. We'll see you about 25 minutes. Have a safe day. Thank you.